Okay, everybody, welcome to today's question and answer with Ligia Andrade Zuniga. Um, we're going to get started. I just wanted to go over a few things about Zoom. Next slide. We have an interpreter with us today and on the screen are instructions on how to join to hear the Spanish interpretation. Next slide. So some Zoom accessibility tips. We have closed captioning. If you click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the screen, captions will appear at the bottom of your screen. Brandon is our ASL interpreter today. And make sure you're in gallery view in the upright, upper right hand corner of your screen. Click on the interpreter's video and click the three dots. You can select pin video at that time and you'll be able to see Brandon throughout the, the, the presentation. When the slides are showing, you can use the vertical bar on the right to make Brandon's video larger or smaller. Next slide. While we're here, please keep your mics muted during the presentation. Keep your cameras off during the presentation so we can easily see Brandon. And during the questions and answers at the end of the presentation, we will unmute you to ask your questions. We, are, we also had some questions submitted ahead of time. So anyway, thank you. Next slide. Like I said, um, they will have answers at the end, questions and answers. You can um, raise your hand down, um, you click on the participants button at the bottom of the screen and you'll see, um, oh, you can raise your hand that way. There's also a reaction button on the, on the screen with a little smiley face and you can raise your hand that way. Don't type questions in the chat because they're not necessarily accessible to everyone unless you need to, if you can't answer and question, ask a question verbally. Okay, next slide. Okay, Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Ligia Andrade Zuniga. Um, I my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a, a Latina woman with a disability. Um, I use a power chair to get a, around. I have a spinal cord injury. Um, I recently was elected to the high school board that I um, that's in my district where I live. So we, um, we represent about nine, eight, nine different schools um, and about six cities um, within our district. We have a fairly large district, um, but within our district, we are very diverse. Um, so we have different communities of different people all over. And so if you can imagine, it really um, becomes a little bit more difficult in, uh, making sure that everyone's included because we wanna really hear from everyone, um, but also in the representation. And so um, I'm very grateful uh, to Dreda for having me today. Um, I'm glad that we're able to have these types of um, informative chats with our communities. And I hope that you find it, um, that you find it uh, good for your, you know, for whatever information you're looking for. Um, please uh, don't, hesitate to ask questions. Um, and later after I'm done, I can leave my email address and uh, we can chat a little further if, if time does not allow. Um, I wanted to start with this slide. It's a slide of a jalapeno and it's on fire and it's actually the mouth of a little face and the eyes are watering up. Um, and then there's little eyebrows on top of the eyes or above the eyes, excuse me. And it says, wash your hands like you just cut habaneros and have to take out your contacts or have to take your contacts out. And I thought it was just funny because now we're talking about COVID and everything that, um, how it's affected us. And we've now learned how to really wash our hands, which is a little disturbing, but, <laughs> but um, it, I just thought it was cute. Um, so next slide, please. 
Okay. So the some of the effects of COVID-19 in our communities um, are, well, we've all been affected in some way, right? I don't think any of our communities have not had any effects. Um, some of them have been more uh, severe in others and other in different ways. And um, some of us uh, just have different situations in our families and different uh, realities. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, address that. Um, for example, in the in in where I live in in my community, in the Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of really difficult times with COVID. Um, I'm Latina, and so speaking for my community, um, we've been hit pretty 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 hard. Um, a lot of people in my community are um, immigrants, and so there's not only a fear of accessing information and services because of the recent um, administration that just left and the fear of being uh, deported and uh, detained in uh, detention centers, um, but also with people that are coming. And there's just a lot of um, uncertainty for this for our community. Um, a lot of our uh, the people in the um, community of people of color are essential workers. Um, they're also uh, domestic workers. Um, and and I mean, those are not just the only professions, you know, but um, we get hit pretty hard, um, especially too with the farm worker communities. I know where I live, um, there, is, there are some rural areas in the county I live in, um, and we have a lot of farms. And so the farms, um, they either sometimes like actually house or um, just employ people that are undocumented um, that work in the fields. But what's happening sometimes is that the, um, the farmers themselves have negated um, services to their, to their workers and have forced them to work um, with, with being infected. And then some of the people in those communities don't even speak Spanish, they speak indigenous dialects. So if you can imagine, you know, what that would do to a community. Um, we have a, a, in that same community, we've got a high school and that high school um, uh, will serve some of their, their kids. And so if the, you know, if they contract uh, COVID, it, it spreads, you know, and um, as we all know, uh, young people, um, it's, it's hard to separate them from their friends and especially since we've been so isolated. So um, it, 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 it causes a really, a really hard um, situation. Um, but also just the inequities in, in services like medical care, education. The other thing was um, language barriers. Um, so going into isolation, um, those are some of the effects. Um, and isolation for very many different reasons because isolation um, can also be, uh, well, a lot of us are confined to our homes, but we're also isolated from services and we're isolated from, um, from care and from uh, financial, um, financial stability. And um, gosh, I mean, there's so many things, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, exposure. Um, a lot of us, we um, are very, oh, well, we're at risk for becoming exposed, again, for many different reasons. We uh, employ people to help us. We um, have to have people help us bring um, our groceries or um, we need to go out to a clinic or um, having home health come. I mean, all of these are, uh, are um, exposure points, right? And so we have to be extra careful. And then because of the complications to some of our disabilities, it can be disastrous. Um, medical rationing was another another issue um we because we do have so many uh, um complications and so many uh situations that come out of our disabilities um we were put onto the back burner of getting services in the hospital systems because they were saying well you know these people deserve this care because they're able to get better and these people are not you know and just the difference in complications of, of care, of how, how difficult it might be for that hospital to access X and Y information. 
um, they didn't have enough services or enough education around people with disabilities to be able to serve people properly at hospitals. So sometimes that would not be very helpful. Um, gosh, I mean, there's again, there's so many reasons. Um, excuse me, access to, oh, access to healthcare. I think we touched on that already. Um, again, accessibility. So like even going into the hospital, <clears throat> making sure that people had um, somebody with them. And that's another thing was at first, everything shut down so, um, so, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my, my word. Um, it, it came down so specifically that nobody was able to go into the hospitals except for the patient. And so that's hard because like for myself, I can't use my hands. I'm completely paralyzed from the chest down. So if I'm laying in a hospital bed and I need something, the nurses are too busy um, running around with you know other patients that have been infected and I'm not gonna get what I need in terms of like drinking water or um, I don't know, anything else that I would need that would require some more assistance would be very, very difficult. And so advocacy was important for that. Um, but also just accessibility in understanding information that's being sent out on COVID. Um, do, are we in our, in our counties, in our cities, in our hospital systems, in our schools, are we sending out information that's not extremely complicated to understand? Because people just get turned off and they will not read it. Um, it, it, if, it's, if the words and the, the ideas around them are too complicated to understand, um, specific jargon, um, it's like speaking another language. It's like you, you, I think we really have to make sure that we are able to target our communities in a way that people are going to get the most information in and be able to understand. Um, but then, like I said, also language and um, technology. Do we have um, enough access to technology? Are we able to use it? Um, the masks, I mean, that's another example, like people that um, are hard of hearing or um, are um, deaf, like ha it, that was very difficult for them to have people wearing masks because they couldn't, the people that could read lips, like they couldn't do that or communicate. And then there's people um, that just have issues communicating that um, that makes it very difficult for them to, to communicate with the masks on. And um, now I think we have a little bit more accessibility in um, like PPE and things like that, but it wasn't like that at first. Um, visibility and participation is important, making sure that we are part of the conversations that are, um, that are um, organizing resources and information for our communities, that we're at the forefront to say, no, this is not going to work for my community, or yes, this is going to be great, or let me suggest this, because I live in this community and I know what this is. And this is who I am and how I identify. So I am right there in that community. Um, deeper connections. We have to make sure, oh, I'm sorry, um, I, I skipped one. Um, now going into more of like the, um, the, the positive stuff um, that we did learn from COVID because there were some positive things. Um, visibility, again, and participation is a two-part two um, item. Um, now that we are remote, a lot of us have been remote for a very long time, even pre-COVID. So um, like for me, I can finally participate um, in person if I'm in the hospital or if I'm home with no care. Lately, mm -hmm. I've been stuck in bed for about a month with no care. And, um, but I can still uh, participate in the school board meetings. I can still participate on other uh, commissions and boards that I'm on. Um, also, um, it, it made people include other people. Um, we develop new ideas. Now we, it's unfortunate, but now people are like, oh yeah, now we can, you know, do it this way, which we were before saying, um, a lot of people can participate if you do it remote, you know, and no, the Brown Act, it, you know, you can't, you, we can't do it remote because of the Brown Act, blah, 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 blah. But now there's all these things that we've learned that no, we can, and we've been saying this. <laughs> so, um, and, and just, um, you know, with other types of things that have, are happening in our homes. And I think like there's other ways that we've learned um, on how to like cope and how to um, kind of organize and manage our lives. Um, the deeper connections we've, we've 
we've made with our families, with our immediate circles, um, has been a lot more in depth um, for some people. Um, and then now, um, also, like I said earlier, like I say, were, were we really that gross? Because I'm like, now we know how to clean properly. And that's kind of disturbing because <laughs> I'm like, I hope everybody was washing their hands. <laughs> but so that that um, is also an issue. But one of the things that the negatives that had come out was um, abuse, that people were more um, more um, in the way of abuse because now they're isolated and sheltered. Um, can uh, can you do the next slide, please? Um, vaccination. So why weren't we prioritized from the beginning? And that is definitely an issue. Um, we should have been up there with the uh, essential workers and with the teachers and everybody. Um, again, because we do employ people to come into our homes or we get other services in other places, um, we were at risk of exposure. And so along with essential workers, we should have also been part of that. Um, and I'm sure there's other um, priorities that people had in the community. Um, access to information, again, it's been a barrier for many of the things that I said before in the previous slide. Um, there's, um, again, you know, it's like language, it's um, understanding, it's um, getting the information to the right people, it's um, uh, technology, all of that. Trans uh, and also being able to um, get appointments because sometimes people don't have access to the internet or are not able to understand how to get an appointment so that that's also very tough. And then people taking the appointment times for people that are prioritized. Um, transportation, some people don't have transportation. Um, what the effects of the vaccines were on our disabilities. It was people really didn't know what ha would happen at first. And so, um, you know, over time, when more people started getting the vaccines, we were able to understand that a little bit better. Um, accessibility, like I was saying, and so accessibility to all these things. And advocacy was important. So we were able to advocate um, for uh, to our senators and our legislators to um, prioritize people with disabilities and it worked. And so this is a great avenue for people to um, to advocate for the communities and be and participate because if we're not visible, if we're not part of those groups, again, we won't be prioritized. Um, go ahead and switch the slide, please. So going on to the school reopenings, it definitely has not been an easy thing. We're not all the same. So in California specifically, we have so many different counties with so many different communities, so many different realities, resources, et cetera. Um, so that what's been very hard is to streamline because it's like, how can you when you have different needs from different people? Um, but what's also been really tough is having the right representation to make sure that all communities get the right resources. Um, we cannot, it's not a blanket. There's no blanket to serve everybody. Um, checking our privileges. So a lot of us have a lot of privilege, even though we don't maybe feel like we do. Um, for me, even though like I have this disability, you know, and um, but I'm also a school board member. I also understand uh, English. I also live um, in a, a community where um, there are a lot of resources. Um, I'm also able to um, give information. So, I mean, you know, there's so many different things. I have friends that ha have helped me get get my vaccine because they, they were looking online for me as well. So again, you know, we need to check our privilege where we have it. Um, conflict, there are many conflicting ideas out there many conflicting priorities, many conflicting um, outcomes that are wanted. Um, and then what's been hard is um, that we also are um, responsible to do the work as it's uh, regulated by the state and by the counties. And so it's not like a lot of us, we would love to have the kids come back, but we have to consider like, this is what can affect this community, this is what can affect this community. And then this is what our, our, our uh, government structures are saying. And so there's only so much we can do, you know? And so that was, that's been a, a huge conflict. 
Um, advocacy has been very important, again, being representative of your community. Because without the proper representation and visibility, we are not going to get what we need. Um, but we need to hear from everybody. Right now, I'm getting a lot of information and, and uh, uh, asks from the same communities. And that's tough because I'm hearing like little things from other people. And so I really have to reach out and extract that information because then I won't get it. Um, remember that we're one community. We can't think just selfishly. We have to make sure that we are considering everybody else because for example, like we had some cases um, from our sports teams and one of those cases was, or one of those players infected their whole team and it was at one of those rural um, undocumented farm worker communities. So can you imagine what that could have done to that school that we that they we played against? What like a lot of those a lot of the people that are in that community don't have access to resources, don't have an extra bedroom to quarantine. So you know it's it's a interconnected society that we live in. What will affect one person will definitely affect other people. Um, what can you do? You can go to your school boards, you can, um, and give public comment. You can advocate to school board members directly. You can be part of uh, groups that are, um, that are uh, disseminating vaccinations and information. Um, you can join commissions and boards and other community groups that um, are serving our community as well as other communities that you might be part of through your intersectionality. Um, there's so many things. Follow the legislations. Follow the um, the um, policies. Um, you can make a lot of you can make a lot of noise subtly if you want, and you can make a lot of noise very loud. So it's up to you on how you, what advocacy looks like for you. But these are some suggestions that I I think are are important um, and that I give people in my community. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is the last, uh, one of the last slides, and I wanted to talk about a little bit about how it's affected my life. Um, so the slide says, the only way to survive is by taking care of each other. And it's by Grace Lee Boggs. She was um, a Chinese American activist um, that um, was very, very outspoken on community and um, being responsible for change. Um, and the slide has, uh, it's kind of cartoon images and it's got orchids on the sides of the words with the words in the middle. And at the bottom of the slide, it has um, a caricature of Grace Lee Boggs. Um, so uh, like I was saying earlier, um, I'm a board member and um, my community, uh, well, I, I guess I'll speak for my family. Um, I have two two kids that went through the district that I, I am serving now. And my younger, my older son is, is home. He's uh, finishing up his degree from, uh, from home. But my younger son is in Iowa studying. Sorry, my older son goes to Utah, to the University of Utah. My younger son goes to Luther College in Iowa. And Iowa State, um, they had a very different policies around COVID-19. Um, and at coming home during the holidays, he contracted COVID-19 while he was out away at school. So I couldn't see my son for about two weeks, three weeks when he came home and it was like right by Thanksgiving. So he quarantined at his dad's house and um, we did Thanksgiving on Zoom. Um, by the time it was better, it, very, it limited our time together, but we had to take that time to, to be separate, unfortunately, and it was very much because of the negligence of um, the policies where he was going to school. Um, so that could have really significantly affected us. I'm very fortunate, well, he's very fortunate and we're, that we had um, minimal effects. He had very slight COVID effects um, or uh, complications. He didn't really have any, um, but that wouldn't have been the same for other communities or other people that like me that I could have contracted it and it would have been a lot worse. Fast forwarding a couple of weeks, his dad is a social worker and he got it. He's uh, obese and he had a, he got a, um, 
he uh, got pneumonia. And so he's in the high risk group. Um, and then he gave it to his parents who are both diabetics. The dad's on dialysis. The mom is got really, really sick. She ended up in the hospital, almost intubated. And so, you know, these, this is all the effects in like sometimes even indirectly because by that time my son was already back in Iowa. And so that, you know, that is a perfect example how this spreads like wildfire. Um, so I just really want to be mindful of um, the effects, mindful of other people in our communities and mindful of the ways that we can protect ourselves and serve each other and be um, and, and really service the, the intersectionality and the interconnectedness that we have, interdependence in our communities. Um, and so I, I leave you with that. The next slide um, is uh, are just a bunch of different resources information that I got um, from different places. Um, there's a lot of great information, but for the sake of time, um, we can open it up to questions and answers. I know I got some, uh, I know there's some questions that are gonna be asked right now. Um, so thank you for your time. And I, um, if I didn't address something, I'm sorry, I was kind of like speeding through. Um, there's just so much information all the time um, that it makes it for like maybe like a two hour presentation for just one topic, you know, but um, we can move on to questions. Thank you. Thank, this is Susan Henderson. Thank you, Lihia. I'm going to put um, a resource that just came through today from the U.S. Department of Justice that this is just one looks long part of it, but there's more. And the link is there, too, about schools and um, and information. Ah, I thought I was going to put. I guess it didn't copy it to it. Right. Hold on a second. Okay, it's in English and Spanish. Oh, I don't know why it's not. I can't get it to put in there. Oh, I'll get that in there in a second. Anyway, we did get a series of questions from people who registered, and I'll go to the first question first. Um, there has been a lack of prioritization of meeting the educational needs of students with disabilities in some districts during COVID. How can we do better in the next disruption of the quote unquote typical school year? Emergency IP planning is one way, but we need more. Leah, your thoughts? Like I was saying before, get involved. People don't know what we need unless they hear it from us or they will assume. And that's been the, one of the biggest challenges in every district, I think, with uh, resources and services for our communities of people with disabilities or any, any, uh, any community that's underrepresented and underserved. That's the problem is that we don't have enough representation. And at the, like, this is a little higher, but it's who you vote for too. You know, it's like, we have to consider who our electeds are and who, what they're, you know, what they're communicating, who they're representing, um, get in their ear, talk with them and say, hey, in my district, this is what's going on. School board members, we need to change this because then we have the power to say, yo, uh, um, superintendent, so-and-so, um, we need to include this in the, you know, whatever services are, are being, are disconnected in our uh, special ed programs. Um, so can we have a, a meeting, you know, or writing letters, you know, or um, reaching out to our specific though more in administration, like the teachers can can definitely advocate, but I think it's it's coming from the top. Um, and then at the highest levels, talk with the school board of education uh, or the school board of education, I'm sorry, the county board of education or the state board of education. Um, there again, you know, it's the representation that we have um, or we're gonna lack what we need. Okay. Okay, the next question was resources for disability rights regarding colleges. Do you have any? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, um, they're, um, the que they're asking if we have any resources for um, disability rights regarding students in college. Um, yes, oh yes, 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 there's a bunch. Um, get in touch with Yo Disabled and Proud get in touch with YLF, um, get in touch with the California State Independent Living Council. Um, and then I think there's also the California State 
Deve uh, developmental, developmental Disability Council, I think as well. Um, but get in, in touch with, um, with those organizations and then you're, you're at your um, community college level as well. There's a community college board um, that you can also advocate to, but there should be resources. Um, and at the, also in the community colleges at the um, disability resource centers, um, some are more robust than others, unfortunately. Um, but if you see something from another district that you wanna implement in yours, bring that information. Um, Cause that is, that it's really important. Um, again, like I was saying, the, the, the um, advocacy is what, what's really important, but, um, but yes, there are resources. Okay, thanks. Um, have there been any conversations for compensating for compensated services for students who did not benefit from virtual therapies or services during um, remote schooling? Yes, um, there has been conversation. And unfortunately, again, like because we are working in my district, we're working in a hybrid. Um, so it's kind of hard to like, to do, um, like everybody is kind of individualized in a sense, I guess. Um, and so that would be up to the teachers to really know what their students are needing. Um, and then, you know, the administrators need to make sure that those services get out to the people that 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 need them. Um, but yes, um, talk with again, talk with your administrators in um, in the districts and then also um, in the specific like if if it is a separate program aside from your district, um, talk with them. But yeah, each each um, and what's really difficult about my presentation is that I'm talking about ours and I, I can't speak to everyone else's because I Honestly, I don't know um, what's going on in the other schools right now. Everything changes day to day. And that's what's the biggest problem for us is like, how do we continuously change information um, and implement it when it's gonna be changed tomorrow, you know? So um, like I said, talk with your own districts, with your own administrators and get that information. Okay, thank you. The next question was, how um, do, do you know if there's um, a certain tier in those, you know, the California has those colored tiers um, that a district needs to be in before their school can, before their schools can open for full in-person instruction as in five days a week, all day? So it, it depends to, um when you're addressing private schools versus public schools in a district, although we don't govern uh, public uh, private schools, but sometimes they're included, <clears throat> excuse me, in the plan. So there's, there's will definitely be a little bit different. And I don't like when people compare the two because we're completely different. Uh, it's two different animals. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I believe it was orange where they can, op or no, yellow, they're yellow or orange where they could open uh, five days. But again, like it, it really all depends on your district mm -hmm. and how fast they're changing information. Like for ours, oh, and the age groups too, because not every age group is the same. Um, and it's also like contracting with your, what, what the MOUs say with your teachers unions. Um, it also with other unions that, because. Each, each school district has to collaborate with so many different people to serve our, our students. And so each interest group has its own uh, priorities and its own um, concerns. And so there has to be negotiations. It's not that simple to just say, oh, we're gonna do this. You can't, you know, there's people with so many different concerns. <clears throat> Excuse me, so it's what, what your district has negotiated, what your county, um, Office of Education is saying, and then also um, how many COVID cases you have in your um, in your area. Um, there's way like there's so many different parts to it. So, like I said earlier, I can't speak to other counties other than my own. Like for our district, we're not opening to five days yet at all, um, and we're in the yellow tier. So um, we just barely went uh, went into welcoming back 
the the students that we um, that wanted to come back because we we sent out a survey asking uh, for the percentages of people that wanted to to come back or not. That way we can plan ahead. And we had like I think the highest percentage was like thirty maybe five percent of of students at one particular school that were going to come back, but the rest the rest were lower than that. And so it you know it, again it also depends on who's coming back, when they're coming back, what type of models you're using, how many cases you have, what's the exposure rate. I mean, there's so many things. Um, so I, I, I apologize that I can't give much more <laughs> concrete information, but um, yeah, just uh, search it for your own county. I think this is Susan. I think we all understand that it's different for every county and district. It's been that way since the beginning. Um, but that said, maybe one of the questions was, how, do you have, is there, um, do you know how much the services and supports for kids with disabilities have been affected by um, going virtual? Um, maybe you can just speak to what's happened in your, your school district. Yeah, um, again, you know, because we have different families with different resources um, and different uh, realities in their, in their families and household. Um, I want to say that our, um, our communities that are lower income, communities of color, um, have had a really hard time, um, especially if the parent now has to stay home um, and homeschool their child, you know, and they can't go out to work. So that affects their rent and all that stuff and stress. And, uh, and so that has definitely affected some things. Um, our other like families that have wanted to go in, we have we have um, we have opened up for um, families that, um, or we have been serving families that have been wanting to come back, especially in this, in the um, in the in the with the uh, students with disabilities, um, through the throughout the summer and stuff. But we opened up kind of in pods, in little little clusters of groups. Um, so that I think. What's affected that might have been the teachers, uh, whether they wanted to come back that quickly or not. Um, so yeah, I, I, the the biggest thing has been um, the negotiation with the teachers um, and the services. But we do have a lot of classified staff that has been working also um, from the beginning of the pandemic, um, and and a lot of that staff has been working with our students with disabilities as well. So I can get you some more concrete information if you would like, um, like some st solid statistics. Um, we're still, I mean, there, it's so early that we really need to like continuously compile information and collect some more um, data around this issue because we don't even know half of the effects. There are some, but that we know that are like more superficial or more like easier to, to, to get, but there's going to be some that are going to um, affect our kids for a, for longer than than now, um, and our families. You know, so like I said, I can get you some more information. Um, I'm going to write my email address in the chat, and please, please email me, um, and I can get in touch with you. Thank you. Now I just wanted to check to see if there was anybody that had want that had raised their um, hand and wanted to ask a question live. Okay. See no hands raised. Okay. Um, all right. Well, Nihia, thank you so much for this information. And I just wanted to um, say that there'll be a follow up discussion next Friday, same time, different link um, on the COVID-19 Schools and Vaccinations by a pediatrician, a well-known pediatrician here in the East Bay, Noemi Spinazzi. So we'll be sending out the invitation for that um, on Monday, over the weekend or Monday morning. So watch your email. Um, the, I put a link in the chat to the statement from the statement of principles from the Department of Justice. So you should, um, it's in English and Spanish. So you might want to check that out. It talks about education and all sorts of um, the rights of people with disabilities in COVID and non-discrimination for many people, for many um, communities. Um, the, um, so it looks like we're wrapping it up. 
thank you so much to our interpreters, Brenda and Brendan and Leticia, and also to thank you very much, Ligia, for this great presentation. And hopefully we'll see all of you next week. Take care. Thank you, thank you so much.